I'm going to talk about one specific part of BELLS. And before I do that, I'm going to tell you what BELLS is. It stands for Biodiversity Enhanced Location Services, of which a georeference matcher is just one. The source of all this was back in May 2020 in a formalized way when Paula Sermoglio led a community forum via the Darwin Core Hour and a couple of later big discussion sections following it on imagining a global gazetteer of georeferences. So from that comes this simple question, and this is how I'm going to formulate what I talk about today, and that is, has somebody else already georeferenced this location I have, and have they done it well enough that I can use it? There's a lot hidden in that simple question. So first of all, in my case, in Bells, I'm going to talk about who those someone else's are. And it's a combination of all data that have been published either to GBIF, iDigBio, or were accumulated in the large-scale collaborative georeferencing projects that eventually became VertNet. We made a gazetteer of that combination of things. Next is we need to be on the same page about location. So here I'm specifically talking about the location class in Darwin Core. And the location class in Darwin Core consists of a lot of terms divided up here by colors and by listings on the left of the things that they pertain to. All these are location terms. So many distinct location descriptions, that's sets of distinct sets of strings in those Darwin core location terms can refer to the same place. Nelson already mentioned this and ways to do fuzzy matching and so on. Usually multiple specimens or observations or both, even across taxa have the same location descriptions or at least are about the same place. And some of those might actually have georeferences. So let's go on to what means, what does it mean to be georeferenced? Already georeferenced means one of those sources has data that fill up this part of the list of Darwin core terms, the georeference ones. And if we're lucky, also populate these georeference metadata terms. So we're talking about a big part of the location class of Darwin core. So then the kicker, what does it mean to be well enough that I can use it? Arnold already alluded to the fact that he was unable to faithfully as a scientist use points for the work that he does. He needs to know what those points mean. Do they mean a country, a continent, or a GPS reading? So let's look at <clears throat> some of the content of what was in GBIF. Again, Arnold alluded to this. Here I'm looking at some specifics about data from a snapshot from GBIF only, not IDIG Bio and VertNet, from July 2022. It consists of <clears throat> more than 2.2 billion occurrence records, which can reduce to 174 million distinct location strings. And of those, 93.8% of the occurrences are mappable. They have points. And 86% of those um, uh, as locations, as distinct locations, also have points. That looks great. That's a lot of data that can be mapped. It can make pretty pictures. I'm not being facetious. I'm being serious because <laughs> Arnold can't use any of that. Neither can anybody else with good faith without delving deep into what those coordinates mean. So one step further is to provide an uncertainty radius. It tells us, well, it's somewhere inside of here. The coordinates are some center of that. So it's mappable with a circle. Now we've reduced our occurrences and our percent of locations drastically. If we go further and try to ask, OK, how much of the content actually follows best practices, a minimum best practice georeference that includes the coordinates and the uncertainty and an identifiable datum that actually allows you to put that point on a map without making a guess. And we reduce that even further. Not so much the distinct locations, that's interesting, but definitely in terms of the percentage of occurrences. Here, I just wanna give you a visual of what I meant there. So 174 million different locations 
47, let's say, percent of those have reasonable georeferences. Again, this, this meshes with what Arnold was saying, about roughly half. Now, let's go one step further and look at a georeference that's theoretically reproducible. The provider of that information gave you enough information that you can check and see if you would get the same answer. It's dismal. It's not reproducible data. So you have to have faith to use even the third row there. Okay, so that brings us to solutions um, to help us along this path of providing better data. And here is a snapshot of the simplest ever web application for trying to get something done without minimal effort because somebody else already did the work. All you have to do is upload a file that has headers, column headers, that either match exactly Darwin core term names or are unambiguously interpretable as those same Darwin core term names. Tell you where you want the result to be announced as an email address, yours or anybody else's, and the file name that you want and submit that and off it goes. So, so far that's a black box. I'd like to fix that and say, well, what's happening inside? First is the construction of a gazetteer of shared locations. And for that, what we have to do is process those location strings, or at least the pertinent parts of those location strings into strings that we can match on. And then from those, we want to be able to compute best georeferences in every case where there's more than one possibility. Then on the flip side, the user side, the georeference matcher side, we want to do the same thing to your input data, process them exactly the same way as the gazetteer did, and see if we can use those process strings to find a best georeference. Very simple in principle. In more detail, what we do is we import all of the snapshot data from those three sources, get distinct records out of those for locations, assign unique location identifiers based on the content of the actual location terms, standardize country codes, select for valid coordinates, select for valid coordinate uncertainties, standardize the coordinate precision to not differentiate between a place that is equal to another place when one of them has seven digits of precision and the other has 25 digits of precision. They're the same place on the planet within a meter. So we're gonna collapse those two. We also interpret the verbatim geodetic datums that have been provided. And we ge calculate a georeference score that tells us between georeference A and georeference B, which one's actually giving us more complete information. With that, we do normalizations into three different strings. The most generic or generalized string is string three that includes the ge higher geography terms without continent or country and with an interpreted country code. It also collapses locality and verbatim locality when they are the same. And it uses the elevation and depth terms. Then matching string two, does the same thing with the location input, except that it'll also add the verbatim coordinate terms if they exist. And then the most, the best or most rigorous match would be one, which is string one, that includes everything from string two plus the decimal coordinate terms. Three minutes After, left. If we get those uh, three strings in place, then we also do some processing to get rid of stuff that has no meaning in order for us to differentiate between different locations. The list of those is here. And then we have three potential strings to get georeferences based on, and we combine all the georeferences for each matching string into sets. And from the set, we try to determine the best result for string one, string two, and string three. The decision is complex. I'm not going to go into it, but basically it's discarding things where there is no consistent answer. This is the same thing that's written out in words. So I'm leaving these in here because I know there will be interest and I want you to be able to see it, but I can't cover it in the short time that I have. Then what happens after what I've talked about is creating the gazetteer and the strings to match on and the best georeferences for every string. Then the georeference matcher takes your input, does the same thing as I said before, and then goes and tries first to make a 
match against string one. If it can find one, it returns that best result. If not, it goes on to string two. And if not, it goes on to string three. And if not, it goes on and sees if it can find at least coordinates for you. And then it returns all of that, everything that you had as input, plus the three strings that were matchable, plus one of the three possible best results in the order in which they were returned. If it was the green one at the top, that's what you get. And the terms, again, not going to go into them, that come back as georeferenced by Bell's data are listed there as best result. We have an example of a proof of concept that I want to go through super quickly. And this is before we got into doing nice tricks to be improved the matching. And it was for nitrogen fixating plants where there were 33 million occurrence records in GBIF. And what we want to do is get only best practice georeferences back, do only exact matching, none of the tricks that I just saw showed, and none of the things like removing continent and country in favor of country code. And that starting situation was 31% of the data were with georeferences, 69 without. After that proto-bells or proto-georeference matcher, we were able to get 11% of those without georeferences to have georeferences. So 11% is non-trivial. And when you talk about the numbers in a big set like this, 3.6 million records, you don't have to georeference. I'm happy with that. So the last thing then is to talk about the fact that there is API integration, Nelson alluded to this. And so either through Symbiota or Geolocate because Symbiota will call Geolocate, and then Geolocate can call the georeference matcher and provide solutions from that service. And that's all I wanted to tell in this super short time that I had to cover a very complex topic. That was amazing, John. Thanks Perfect. for putting those slides that we can pause on as well. Uh, that's really wonderful.